my name is Khan Chukert. I'm the lead level designer for the PU. Um, I will give you an introduction to the to our locations when it comes to the design, a high level overview of the design uh, of our locations. I'm going to describe you the processes of our workflow and the goals that we aim to achieve. So um, to break down our process a bit, this is very high level, but it starts out with the pre-production phase and ideation phase. Here we, uh, everything starts out in the mind. We bring it down to paper, sketch, write, formulate a plan based on our overall design goals. And then it moves on to the blocking stage. You may, might have heard of this, like uh, the white box and gray box phase. Um, this essentially contains all of the gameplay that you would see in, in the final product. Basically, the way it's meant to be played. And we test this out with a lot of iteration and, yeah, a lot of testing. And it's basically the white box is not in a stage where it's presentable, but that comes now. So on the right, as you see, the food court that Adam is going to be showing you later. Um, yeah, this is the final product, VFX, lighting. And everybody had their pass on this. And level design or other designers still maintain this, maintains the space and makes sure that, makes sure that uh, the systems that get created are being retroactively implemented. All right. Um, so one key aspect of game development in general is the balance of narrative, visuals, and gameplay. So all these interplay, they interconnect, and it's the foundation that runs through all game environments. Um, so it's important to communicate context. And here in this drawover, you see that um, narratively, we see sort of a dangerous environment, the spiky shapes here. Um, are sort of threatening. We see defensive structures. We can expect some enemy NPCs here, but it's also an old village. Maybe there's some exploration, some loot to be found. And then what's also important is communicating goals. So goals can be the pathways that you take, uh, the, the gateways that bring you from one step to another, and so on. Hey, whoops. There we go. OK. Uh, since we're a sandbox game, um, accommodating play styles is pretty important. So play styles meaning going guns and blazing, shooting at everything and everybody, uh, going more of a stealthy infiltration-y pathway if you wanted to, but also all the social aspects that you know from um, Stanton. And to do this, we establish so one of the core design philosophies is granting the player the freedom of choice to do what they want to do at any point uh, throughout their experience. And we do this by establishing uh, or defining multiple pathways of, or archetypes that we call primary, secondary, and tertiary pathing. So the first one is pretty straightforward. In a social setting, you have the goal right in front of you, and it's a single goal, su such as here in the Habs. In a combat setting, this is very exposed, so it's dangerous to traverse this uh, route. Uh, where it gets more complex is when you have, such as with this outpost here, when you have multiple goals um, that can be equally important to the player at any given point. This is where we need to have a bit more um, design put into it with, for example, the landmarks that serve as orientation points. Uh, so to help you orient yourself wherever you are in this location, and leading you to, to these locations by utilizing shape language and composition. Uh, the second path is, these are secondary pathways, so these are alternative routes. And these are options that are offered to you as you traverse the area on the primary path, for example. And so you may know this as a tourist when you go to, to a new city and you look around the corner and you see an alleyway that sort of looks nice and it, it evokes your curiosity and you want to investigate. Uh, in a combat setting, these are covered approaches or opportunities for you to flank the enemy to get to your goal, which could be this building um, on that sketch. Um, yeah, versus more open spaces when you have in a, in a combat setting, in open spaces, you tend to be a bit more stationary because you uh, want to feel more secure, uh, unless you're in a vehicle. The third path is 
tertiary pathing. So these are more hidden infiltration routes, especially uh, discoverable throughout the uh, rundown stations that Anna will be uh, presenting later on. And these are mostly discoverable to the attentive eye. You can explore these, find loot, or different routes to traverse through the station. Environment interactivity. You might have seen this in a previous presentation. Um, it's very important to ground the player to their environment, offering them ways of interaction, uh, being able to change the state of rooms to toy with the AI, or just simply being able to unblock your uh, pathway. What gets a bit more complex is when you talk about resource network systems, such as in day one when Torsten mentioned that we are planning to implement this as well in locations. And this will allow the player to engage with their environment in different ways. They will be able to power up or down uh, entities such as turrets, gates, and doors, and also alter life support systems. And also, this ties into security systems. So being able to power up or down certain sections of a security system. And security systems, systems in turn, will be dependent on security tokens that you will be able to grab from other NPCs in your environment to then gain access to other terminals, uh, to security terminals or other areas. Um, reputation is a big topic for us, especially with Pyro. So reputation, what does it mean? It means that it's basically your standing, your relationship with factions, and factions are the UEE and Stanton, or uh, outlaw gangs, uh, especially now in Pyro. And this will define your play style within this environment. So it will define how you experience the location that you're in, uh, in a more social context or more in a more com combative uh, context. Um, so we talk about reputation gates as well, especially in the later representation, uh, presentations. Um, so in the case of the food court, in the rundown station, we have uh, multiple floors. So the first floor is the gang floor, and that might require you to have a better uh, relationship with the owner of this location, which then will give you unique mission givers uh, that you can go to and accept a mission that are offering you missions themed after the faction or the owner of this location, but also give you access to uh, unique gear, collectibles, ship weapons, and items. You might have seen these locations in the demo if you've played it. So to close this all off and move on to the other presentations, um, the glue behind all of our locations is, is the content. It's, it is the reason why you go to these locations in the first place, and our ma main goal right now is to not have that divide between social and gameplay as much as we do in, in Stanton, but mix it up a little and make that dependent on, on the reputation that you have with the factions or the owners of these locations. And yeah, we're looking into more content. Um, as you've seen listed there, there's a bunch of new stuff coming as well. Um, with the later presentations, for example, with the logistics hubs in the second portion, uh, we are also looking into rates. But yeah, um, that's it for me. I will pass it over to Eddie now. Hope you've enjoyed this. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Hi, everybody. So, um, I'm Eddie, I'm an assistant art director on Star Citizen for Locations. Um, before we start, I'd like to mention that all of the footage we're about to see comes from our current stable builds. So, all of that beautiful tech, all of those features that we've seen in the last two days is coming from our tech development builds. Now, all those features are going to make their way to you, of course, eventually. Uh, but that is the reason you're not going to see some of them in the builds today. I just wanted to get ahead of the comments a little bit there. Um, so with that said, what am I going to be talking about? Well, I'm really excited to show you that the heart of the hard work that um, the Sandbox One team have been doing to expand our new outpost locations. I'm going to start by going over how we've expanded the library and what that means we can now achieve with the new locations and then how we achieve that variety from the library by categorizing our locations into both archetypes and themes and what that means for you as a player. So 
I don't know if you remember this, but at Sitcom in 2021, uh, we showed this new style of outpost for the first time. Now, at this point, we had our art style locked in. Um, we'd worked on our library of content to the point where we could make smaller locations like this one, but with a limited amount of variety between each one. And this is what that library of modules looked like at that point. Um, we'd established our main building modules as well as some of our larger buildings and a number of smaller secondary and dressing and standalone modules. But each outpost couldn't be too large without there being some obvious repetition between the modules used. So let's have a look at that library today. So, in order to achieve that greater visual and design delta between each outpost and have them not feel like exact clones of one another, we've massively expanded our module library in terms of breadth and depth. And what I mean that, we, we go broad by making more modules with different purposes, and we go deep by creating multiple thematic overlays for each of those modules as well. And I'll, go into that, I'll go into what that means a little bit in a minute. But the challenge of a sandbox location like this as you can see, it's not about building a single unique location. That can be quite straightforward, to be fair. It's about giving our artists and designers the building blocks, the, the affordance to build multiple locations that all feel somewhat different, even if they do share that same basic DNA. So it's about creating both the ingredients at the same time as the recipes and making sure all of those flavors work in harmony with one another for both visuals and gameplay. So every individual part has to take into consideration all of those design philosophies. So every single module has to take into consideration those design philosophies that Khan mentioned. But we also have to make sure that they work with those same principles when an artist or a designer combines them into any one of a number of different layouts. So the more ingredients we have to work with, the more recipes we can create. But with that complexity comes the challenge of keeping everything harmonious. So we like to think we've done a pretty good job with that, but that's me. Um, using this expanded library, we've been able to increase the individual location size because there's less of that obvious repetition between buildings within any single location. And we can't really call some of these large locations outposts anymore. They become something more like settlements and imply a larger and more established community. Now, as a player, it will mean a lot more to explore and do at any single individual location with a localized and personal feeling mission types that might see you moving around a single settlement to complete objectives or doing short hop missions between clusters of settlements on a single planet. So you might head up to a ridge to repair some wind turbines. You could counter an outlaw attack from a neighboring outpost. Or on the opposite side, you might be stealing or destroying vehicles for the criminal gang that you're working for. But in the art department, we always say, show, don't tell. So let's stop looking at slides, and let's have a look at some of the locations in-game. Thank you. So what flavors of Outpost did we just see there? Well, we categorized them in two different ways, as I said, and then we mix and match those categories together to provide that variation. Now, the first and primary category is the archetype, and they provide that core gameplay hook and define the main function of a settlement. So scrapyards have a landing pit module for repairs and refueling. Mining operations can have a refinery module and ore extractors for resource and commodity trading. And trading posts themselves allow a broader range of item purchases 
through the dedicated trade building module. And I mentioned earlier some more like general mission types that you might find that would be agnostic of archetype. And the archetypes themselves reflect that primary gameplay function of a settlement, but there's also a middle layer. Of course, we don't want these locations to just be a glorified shop or repair station. So there's going to be more secondary activities to do locally to an outpost that are also defined by its archetype. So you may find scrapyards can offer salvage-related gameplay and missions. Trading posts can also deliver, offer delivery missions or hauling and cargo gameplay. And farms can offer crops and fauna as resources for gathering or trading. So, with archetypes as a primary category, in addition, we mix in a secondary category, and these are the thematic overlays. Now, at the moment, we have two main themes. Internally, we call these independent and outlaw. So themes offer additional variation on top of the archetypes to inform the look and feel of a location, not just visually, but which people you'll interact with there, how they'll respond to you based on your rep, what types of missions you'll have available to take on. So themes don't change the fundamental architecture of a space or the archetype of a location, but they do drastically alter the mood and feel, as well as altering the gameplay experience significantly. Uh, and again, let's take a look at the first of our themes, our independent theme. Thank you. So as a neutral player, the independent theme presents a much more social, visual, and gameplay experience. Um, the primary visual read across both themes, so across both outlaw and independent, comes from those common architectural forms. And they're generally all more rounded and soft in shape. And the building manufacture techniques are more robust and primitive with single-story single dwellings built from stucco and bare metal. But for this theme specifically, we use soft textiles, warm lighting and color palettes, foliage, decoration that layer on top of those utilitarian structures to give that sense of home. And I use the word home for our independent theme quite a lot because we really want to get that feeling that this is home for the people that live there despite those harsh realities of frontier life. And in contrast to that, we have a theme that lies in a direct opposition to the independence, which we call the outlaw theme. So let's take a look at that now as well.
So the outlaw theme tells that story of these once functional settlements being completely overrun by the various criminal elements that inhabit the system. And visually, we have themes of a regressed and subverted civilization. So we layer on top of the architecture these spiked and aggressive forms, and we have evidence of our squalid living arrangements, and lighting comes from fires or poorly maintained fixtures. Some spaces are going to be recognizable as deformed versions of the independent theme, but some have been completely changed to more uh, nefarious purposes. Um, and while both themes employ all of the various alternative pathing and traversal considerations that Khan detail, detailed just earlier, um, the outlaw spaces are weighted more towards combat. But just because these spaces are more dangerous and the experience can be more combative, that doesn't mean that the archetype of the outpost is lost. So if you as a player choose to be a criminal working up your rep with a headhunter gang, you'd be welcome at the trading post and you'd be able to buy and sell items or take on missions. But you probably won't then be very welcome at the independent themed locations and that's where you'd get your combat experiences. So while the outlaw theme looks very different, the functionality of those archetypes still remain. So I've talked about the kinds of outposts we've been hard at work on, and I hope you've enjoyed checking them out over the last two days uh, in the Pyro demo. It's really made me very pleased to see Paul playing our content at last, so thank you for that. Uh, but where are we heading from here? Well, I hope it should be obvious that we're going to get these out for the first Pyro release. Uh, we still have some final optimization and polish passes to do across the whole library. We're also going to be expanding the amount of these locations throughout Pyro and beyond. And our tools allow us to do that very quickly now. And we've got the library as well to do it. And the new outposts are not limited to the Pyro system. They're completely um, system agnostic. So you can expect to see these outposts in other systems as well. And of course, we're going to look to add more ingredients, more of those modules to the library as well to further expand the variety and depth that you'll be able to see at these new locations. We want to encourage more on-foot gameplay within a smaller ecosystem of a planet to give that more localized and personal feeling experience. Our goal with these locations, as with many of the others we're going to hear about today, is to continue to work on the gameplay so that every location offers a rich playground to explore. And I guess I'd like to finish just by thanking everyone for listening today. It's really great to see you all. I'm going to pass you over to Nick who's going to talk about some locations that are coming in the nearer future. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. You. We are French Canadian on the here. Cool. All right guys, my name is Nicolas Pinchot. I'm from Montreal. I'm a stand art director and I'm here today to show you the next new derelict settlement we did. But just before that, I just want to say thank you to everyone who worked on that mandate. It's, you guys made an awesome work. I'm super happy and proud to be here today to show you that, all of you guys, and to the world. So let's go to the chase and let me present you the new Derelict Settlement.
Pretty cool, guys, eh? Oh, by the way, we made more than four. It's not just four. We made more than that. So we split those settlements in two categories, social and hostile. In the social one, we will have drop-off mission, shops, food, loots, and drinks. And hostile one, obviously, will be more focused combat. Let me show you what it looks like. I like the end. The end is awesome. All right, in summary, guys, we're going to have a lot of new location on planets, links with nice mission and good gameplay. And the most important, all those locations will be in Q4 this year's available in the game. So thank you very much. I will let now Adam to show you more good stuff. Thank you. Oh, mic. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. So, welcome to Rust Stop Stations. I'm Adam Sanders, lead environment artist for EUL1. We're excited today to show you our efforts for the Pyro Rest Stop Stations. So, what are Pyro Rest Stop Stations? Well, these are stations reinvented. These have new themes, archetypes, and gameplay to support new and interesting experiences. Aside from the social aspects, there is gameplay and exploration on the location. I've hoped you had a chance to play the demo over the past couple of days. I know I've spoken to a few of you. It's pretty good, right? Yeah? It was a sneak peek of our current progress. Let's kick off with an overview of the Pyro system. For the Pyro system release, we plan on six planets and 26 stations, including jump point stations that connect for Stanton and future systems such as Magnus. Rest stop stations are either in rundown or abandoned states. Citizens of Pyro, the Rough and Ready Outlaws, and Xeno Threat may control these. 
Our focus today will on the rough and ready owned Pyrotech Amalgamated Fuel and Resource Station, Planet 2, Lagrange Point 4, otherwise known as Checkmate Station. So to create a richer experience from rundown stations, we have three key points. So our increased reputation gives you access to new areas, unique gear, and mission givers. It's also, it also relates to basic functions such as the halved clinics, which need at least a neutral standing with their owners. Combat can take place anywhere, including social areas. Numerous options for environment traversal and enhanced environmental interactions. We aim to include new substation areas such as the workers' area, lower deck, and maintenance areas. These areas will offer unique content, more environment interactivity, and interconnection between areas. Our journey begins when the player arrives in the entry deck view room. The entry deck serves as the first barrier between the outside world and the interior of the station. Some inhabitants are prevented from going inside and are stuck here with no means of getting out. Slums are formed beneath the bridge, smuggling routes established. Some shopkeepers will sell you water and food on your way into and out of the station. Let's have a look. Khan touched on reputation earlier. Let's see how that is applied to the stations. So how does the reputation gate in the entry deck affect gameplay? What happens if we have good reputation? So if you had good re reputation, you could go straight through. This is no fuss, and it's the quickest way to maneuver through the station. 
However, you've got to put the time and the effort in to get to this point. What happens if you neutral reputation? So you might be waved through. Maybe you have to pay a bribe, and you don't want to pay, so you can have to find an alternate pathing. Or you can have to build up your reputation. If you have bad reputation, and for all you naughty ones out there, I know some of you exist, this applies to you. In short, you can have a tough time, but you have options. So stealth via other pathways might be one of those options. You build your reputation up from scratch, or you could probably fight. Let's focus on those alternate pathways. The modules in the station are broken up into several traversal areas. As with the other location archetypes, we define these spaces as secondary or tertiary routes, as opposed to the more official primary paths. Most modules are interconnected with vents and maintenance shafts. These reward the players with infiltration and exploration paths, as well as potential loot. So what alternative routes exist to enter this, access the station? We'll offer the opportunity to access the station through multiple EVA points on the exterior. It gives you the choice on how to tackle missions and reputation issues. These alternative entries allow the player to circumvent the ATC loop completely. Useful for when your reputation with the owners would normally prevent you from going through more official ways. These server spaces that provide content aligned or against, aligned or against the owners of the station. The maintenance hatch access points are a new common sublocation to the stations. The stations are planned to house maintenance areas that increase the interconnection between all the different sub areas of the station. They act as alternative pathways the player can take to traverse from the entrance area to the Galleria, for example. Now let's have a look at our main social space. The market. A central location for the controlling faction, it houses all their nefarious activities. You can participate in their endeavors if you have the right rep. Let's have a look at some of those key features. So the market is a social hub and a good example of mixing social and gameplay space, as mentioned by Khan earlier. Another reputation gate can be found in the market. The ground floor is open to the common public. The upper floor is reserved to rough and ready outlaws and their associates. If you have increased reputation, you can access the area. You can access this area, which gives you access to premium items, top tier mission givers, and access to new areas. We plan to house mission givers in both tiers that will give you unique jobs to further your reputation and fame across Pyro. Now let's have a look at another theme. Abandoned is a new non-social location theme. Let's have a quick look at the current abandoned area on Checkmate. So we have entire abandoned stations as separate locations. 
On top of that, there are abandoned areas within the Randown stations, much like the ones you probably see in the demo. There will be around 15 of these around the pyro system. These are accessible through airlocks and breaches or other means. We aim to enhance all the space locations with a lot more gameplay content. Loot runs, exploration, creatures, missions of various types with PvE and PvP content, just to name a few. We're also laying a focus on env environment interactivity with potential retrofitting of occupied stations. With the future addition of security systems and the resource network system, we will have the means to further improve the experience within these spaces and offer new challenges. With power, life support, and gravity playing a key role to give the player a unique experience, especially in abandoned stations. So, what do pyro rest stations bring to the game? So lots more variety in space stations, with more gameplay opportunities within a station location. Opportunities for exploration, hidden areas, multiple options for access or traversal. These are faction-owned, and reputation will affect the location and gameplay. These feature lots of new mission opportunities within social space and multiplayer opportunities for combat on location. So I hope you have enjoyed this, this sample of what stations will offer and had a chance to have a go on the demo the past couple of days. That concludes the Living on Edge presentation. Thank you for your time. <laughs>